Our next, if he is already available, is Sam, G4DDK. Oh, are you there? Yeah, I, I, I thought you, you might be uh, selling uh, uh, LNAs. Um, <laughs> I think about 99% of the Moonbounce community uses Sam's VLNAs. About. <laughs> he got himself world famous in the Moonbounce family for designing those excellent preamps. And do not forget his unprecedented after sales service. When you get yourself in trouble, Building one of his VLNA kits, simply send him an email and wait. Often, if not always, the answer is in your mailbox within 30 seconds. <laughs> Yet, he finds the time to design new goodies for us EMEers. This time he designed an excellent 70 centimeter transverter. Sam called his new product ICNI. He will explain why. I'll start. It's all yours. Thank you, Jan. Uh, I'm really surprised at how many people are here today. I thought you thought, well, this is a hardware talk, so maybe we'll go and do something else. <laughs> I'm being unkind, I'm sorry. A couple of years ago at, uh, at the French meeting, I spoke about uh, a two-meter transverse that I, I had uh, produced uh, called the Anglia. It was later updated. Um, as as um, Alex told us earlier on today, um, when Leaf uh, reviews something for you, you have to stand back because you're probably not going to be pleased. He will do a really good job on it, and I really mean that sincerely. So with the Anglian, he uh, thought of a few, uh, based on the work that he had done, he suggested a few changes which improved it quite dramatically, and that became the 3L. But I had a number of people saying, oh, when are you going to do a 70 centimetre transvert? I want the 70 centimetre one. Um, and I didn't particularly feel like doing one at the time. I'd spent a lot of time on the Anglia. Um, a friend of mine who sadly passed away uh, about um, two and a half years ago, just before he passed away, and I hope had nothing to do with this, he gave me a couple of mixers to try, and I looked at these and I thought, ah, these would go well on 70 centimetres, the mixer that was in the two metre one, not suitable for 70 centimetres. So, what resulted is this transverter, which I call Iceni, uh, and it was based around these mixers from P to G3 PYB, so I have to thank Peter for really kicking this off, and uh, to Leaf, of course, for the uh, information that he suggested that I did with the 2 meter one, which I've translated to the 70 centimeter one. Uh, we'll talk about a little introduction, which is a laser. So a little introduction to why Iceni, because that's probably a very strange name to you. A little bit about the design of the Iceni. Um, something of an analysis, I'm not going to go into that too, uh, too deeply. Uh, something on frequency locking, which is something which I'm frequently asked about. And a little summary at the end. This is a picture of the uh, Iceni. In fact, I suspect that was an earlier one. This is... This is what it actually looks like. Uh, several people have asked about buying this one. You really wouldn't want this one. This one's had just about everything done to it. Uh, but that's Iceni, um, and it's on a yellow board. Uh, sorry, on a on a blue board, uh, and I'll explain why that is in a moment. Okay, so it's pronounced Iceni. Iceni were a Celtic tribe who lived in the eastern part of England about 2,000 years ago. They were there when the Romans invaded the first time. And um, after a, a bit of a, a, a fight with the Romans, um, they had a queen who took over and who, for her own very good reasons, decided to drive the Romans out. And uh, she got together a number of tribes and they took on the Romans at a city called uh, Colchester. The Romans 
thought they could introduce all these rules into the UK, you know, that you would do this and you would do that and, and, and you'll follow the rules that we dictate. Being a good Brit, she decided we don't want to do this. She tackled them in um, Colchester, which was the kind of the regional um, centre for, for, for all sorts of things, but it wasn't a garrison. They wiped it out, burnt it to the ground, followed on and did exactly the same in London. But eventually uh, was defeated at Verulam, which is the name of a very famous British radio club. But I like to think that this was the very first attempt at Brexit. <laughs> and I strongly suspect it's going to end up in the same result. <laughs> Why blue? Well, I think of it. The Iceni went into battle wearing paint, blue paint, woad. That's my tribute to them. <laughs> A quick look at the architecture. Now, um, I, 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 no, I'm not going to apologise. I'm still stuck in the old world of analogue. This is, will be a very familiar design to most of you here. It's a single mixer, heterodyne type arrangement. It converts 2 megahertz of the 70 centimetre band to 2 megahertz of the 10 metre band. You all know these transverters you've bought. Demi ones, you've bought microwave module ones in the past, but now of course you use um, TS2000 and an IC910 or whatever. But there's still a few people out there who are running HF rigs like K3s, uh, 7300s and so on, and, and a transverter is still a very attractive way of getting on the 70 centimetres. But when this was designed, it wasn't designed to be a high performance transverter, really it was to get these people off my back who wanted a 70 cent transverter. In the heart of it we've got the mixer, the mixer is as I've said is um, the one which uh, Peter kindly uh, gave me a, a few of these to play with, uh, it's an ADE 13, it's a 1600 megahertz mixer, so 70 cents and nicely in the middle of its band. It's followed by a filter arrangement, a transmit amplifier with its own filter, a receive amplifier. After the mixer on the receive side, there's a, a post mixer amplifier, a very strong one. Uh, and on the input side, there's an input attenuator, so you can adjust the input level, the IF drive level. Is that right? People's away here? Um, local oscillator, sorry, you don't have to go back over here. Local oscillator, 101 megahertz, perfectly standard, times four multiplier to drive the mixer. Really nothing unconventional in there at all. Don't worry if you can't read that, I am not going to concentrate on it. That just happens to be the schematic of the Iceni. Now before we go any further, I do need to do a device update. As most of you will be aware, Broadcom uh, bought out uh, Avago, which was Agilent, which was HP, which is Avantech. In their infinite wisdom, Broadcom decided that they would discontinue most of the range. All the really useful devices are now on last production run. You want some ATF 54143s, which we all love? Certainly, sir. How many tens of thousands do you want? Fortunately, uh, Mini Circuit Inc. Have, have decided that uh, some of their devices are very compatible. They're done in a totally different fab. So, um, 105 Plus um, basically replaces that MGA30689, which is a really nice device, which is suggested to me as a device to use in here by John G4SWX. Uh, during his review of the Anglian, uh, Leaf decided that the uh, SPF 5043 was a heap of, um, well, you could have come from Colchester. Um, he strongly suggested the PSA45043 as a replacement. The SPF5043 has an internal bias regulator problem, which means it produces an excessive amplitude noise. Its noise figure, the frequency of interest, is interesting. You go down low in frequency and the noise comes up dramatically in a mixer system. That's not necessarily good news. So the PSA45043 is the replacement for it, and it's a better device. Uh, and just another um, update here, 
um, because of the VLA amp, uh, VLNA amplifiers and the demise of the 54143, uh, goodness, how does he remember these numbers? Um, there is a replacement for that. I've, I'm sorry, I have got the number wrong. It's not an SAV540, it's an SAV541+. plus. I put them in the VLNAs. They are as good as, if not better, than the 54143s. The best thing is they're the same price. Recently I did an upgrade to the ICD. This was based upon some suggestions by, um, firstly, uh, a German operator, who I've acknowledged somewhere in the paperwork, I think, and then uh, one of, I think, one of, one of the ONs also asked this question, why have you used the ADE 13? Well, as I told you, I had a few to play with. It's only a level seven mixer, but I overdrive it at plus 13. The thought was that, you know, traditionally, you can get more dynamic range out of a mixer if you drive it hard, as a switch. It doesn't really work with the ADE 13. You don't get much improvement at all. So you've got all that excess at loss later. Um, the suggestion was to try uh, the ADE 751MH. Now, there is no pin compatible replacement for the ADE 13. 751 has the IF and RF ports reversed. The pins are in different positions. I tried it in the normal position. I managed to get hold of a couple of samples. It was dreadful, really dreadful. But um, DH5YM, I think it was, suggested, well, let me have a mixer. I'll swap two pins over, I cut and scrap. Uh, and he reported back, it's a dramatic improvement in performance. And then when uh, the ON suggested try and do the same thing, I, I had a, another spare mixer, so I sent him one. And again, he did a full, no, sorry, it was OK, it's one of the OK lads. And he reported that at his um, uh, university, where he did a lot of measurements, and that he was actually measuring a big improvement in performance. So of course I had to have a go, and that's why there's now an upgrade. So the standard, kit that I offer now has the 751MH, but there is a small price to pay. I won't talk about that just for the moment. But if you get a kit, that's what comes in there. But if you want to revert, you can. This is all that the upgrade involves. Take the old mixer out, put the new one in, cut two tracks, strap from that bottom pin across to C37, that's the IF connection, little piece of coax to the filter input from the mixer, and that's it, that's the upgrade. You've already got the right amount of local oscillator. This is a plus 13 mixer, and you've got plus 13 of a local oscillator already. It's a very simple modification. <clears throat> now, it's worth having a quick look at the receive side and what we're trying to achieve here. This is the ADE 13, analyzed somewhat crudely, using AppCAD. AppCAD is still my favourite programme for doing this. Um, SCALC is, is a, an equivalent, very, very good programme, but I've, I've kind of got used to this one. Don't worry about all the numbers you see on there, but I have uh, put at the top there the PSA4 input, the diode switch, the TOCO filter, the mixer, the diplexer, the post mixer amplifier, and then the IF filter at the output. I've allocated noise figures and uh, gain and output IP3 to each of those stages. And what you see then in the middle of that uh, is a, a number in blue, uh, some numbers in green, and some numbers in red. And what you see is, the, looking at the, the red ones here, the higher that number is towards one, the worse the stage is, the more susceptible it is. It has the lowest dynamic range, if you like. So we see in this version of the 13 that we get 0.4 with an ADE 13, 0.36 with the input stage. They're well matched together in terms of dynamic range, but you usually want to make sure the mixer is better than 0.4. Um, when you run the numbers on that, what you see is that that should give you a gain of 22.4. I measure 22, 23, uh, with that mixer, 
it says 1.47 as the noise figure. Well, I regularly measure about 1.7, 1.8, so marginally higher. Uh, there's some other numbers in there. The output IP3, what's that? Plus 28 something or other. That's going to be probably higher than your 10 meter IF rig uh, has, so it's not going to be the big limitation of dynamic range. If we move to the 751, then what we find is that the mixer really is no longer a real problem at all. It drops to 0.14. Um, the front end now definitely becomes the limitation. And somebody, at least one person in the room is going to say, oh, put a PGA 103 in there. That's a better stage than the PSA 45043. It doesn't fit on the board, so I haven't bothered to do it. If you want to do it yourself, do it. Let's see the results, please. Um, noise figure drops. This is partly because the conversion loss of the 541 is slightly better than the AD13. Uh, so 1.2 mm -hmm. and 23 point something or other are the measured uh, performance figures, the headline figures. There's also output IP3 numbers and that in there. I'm not going to concentrate too much on that. This is measuring it. This is a with the 751 measured, uh, just to confirm those numbers. Uh, with the IF at 28 megahertz, 1.27 dB noise figure. That's almost good enough to use for most purposes without having a preamp in front of it. 24.4 dB of gain. Usual caveat supply. This is my measurement. Previously calibrated equipment no longer in calibration, and I'm sure your mileage will vary. Um, there were some other slides, I've taken them out, they just showed you what happened at 29 megahertz IF and then 30 megahertz. And it goes up to about one and a half dB with a, at 30 megs or uh, 434 megahertz input. Not very much, no. Yeah, within a dB. Yeah, the gain stays within about dB. Well within a dB, if I recall. <laughs> Okay, just a little bit more complicated. Measurement of dynamic range, uh, and again, John will confirm this for me, the difficulty in making these measurements. If you've ever done a third order type extrapolation, it's a very difficult thing to, to do, to get repeatable. But here we've got uh, the ICNE. I've got two signal generators, a Roman Schwartz SMG, which I've got set on 432.180. Uh, Marconi Instruments 2024 set on 432 200. Uh, these two are brought together in a ZFR SC42. That's a very good, very low intermod splitter. If you want to ever do these tests, that's one I can highly recommend. <laughs> then into a tech scan step attenuator. Now, here we see the spectrum on my HP uh, 8592L. Uh, here are two tones, each at neg 40 dBm. And the third orders that are generated in the mixers between them and in the splitter and that, and there. you really just cannot see them. They're below the noise floor of my analyzer. And yes, I could do all those sort of things and tell you exactly what it is. But that, for, for the purposes of this, that was sufficient. Um, calibrate round the ICNE, then look at uh, the output uh, at 28 megahertz where we're now seeing with NEG40 per tone input, NEG16 per tone output. This is with the AD13, remember, on the 8592. And you can just see the third order products in there. That's as the figures were, and that was producing, an, using App, AppCAD again, using the uh, intercept part of the program, uh, about NEG8, uh, third order input intercept for two tones, which is not too bad. It's probably better than most black boxes, can do better. Here are those numbers plugged into AppCAD. Uh, we've got 24 dB of gain. Uh, NEG35 in this particular case, this is now with a 751 mixer in there, so I'm sorry I have mixed the two up. So. 30, uh, 24 dB of gain, neg 35 per tone input, because it can tolerate a bigger input. Uh, measure the level of the IMD at the output per tone. This tells us now that we've got uh, neg 1 dB M, third order input intercept. And here it is plotted over here, and also it shows you what the output third order is. That's the bit that you'll 
receiver is most worried about, and that wants to be at least comparable and probably better than your rig. Put that into an FT817, but you're going to do that anyway because it's already got 70 sends, but uh, TS120 maybe? Oh my goodness, the TS120 is going to fall over long before the transverter does. Uh, a quick transmit analysis, just so you see what's happening here. This seems to cause a lot of people a lot of difficulties. Mainly, the, the limitation in here is how much level you can put into the mixer before the output intermods start to become unusable. So we've got an attenuator at the input, and if you put in zero dBm, set that to a minimum, the signal goes through a bandpass filter, because not all rigs, and that includes K3s and that, are that clean at 28 meg output. You go off a few tens of megs either side, and there are some nasty signals there. Diode switch, diplexer, so we've got about neg 3 going into the mixer. 404 local oscillator going in at uh, plus 13. Uh, a triple helical filter, diode switch, transmit amplifier first stage, another triple bandpass filter, output amplifier low pass filter, for zero in, the whole thing's about 17 dB of gain, you have plus 17 dBm out. Seems low, I know, but if you go into, say, a Mitsubishi module, you don't need even that much to, to saturate the output, even the bigger ones, even the, uh, the 30 or 60 watt ones, that's more than sufficient. So that's what the chain looks like. Those are the levels with the 751. Just to show, these are the filters. This was, this was a real problem area because what do you use? The suggestion was, well, yeah, use saw filters. I, I'm very suspicious of saw filters since I had a couple shatter on me a few years ago when I worked uh, in BT research labs, they don't like a lot of uh, signal up them and, and in a, a situation like uh, um, a transverter, the transmit chain is probably going to be seeing some fairly high level signals. So I, I've tended to avoid them. I found that Franco, um, although these are no longer made, uh, unless you want to buy a reel of 10,000 and then there's several people who make them for you, uh, he sells these at quite low cost. And it, this particular one is a uh, four 50 megahertz filter, but it tunes quite happily with acceptable input and output return loss all the way down to 432, and they're relatively cheap. So I used two of those, and they had thousands in stock. <coughs> when they're gone, they're gone. Uh, what have we got here? Oh, this is just having a quick look at the output spectrum. This is... Um, the output spectrum 432, the second harmonic is purely because there is only one low pass filter stage at the output, because I'm expecting that you're going to be driving something else beyond this. It's got to generate harmonics, so it's going to want its own low pass filter. Um, apologies for this one. This is two tone from a K3 input. Um, my analyzer only goes down to 300 hertz, so I couldn't quite um, get the sort of spectrum you like, but you can see the the, the uh, first pair of sidebands from this, and they're about 40 dB down. And that's at uh, 50 milliwatts plus 17 dBm pet output. I see I have a preview on here of what's coming next. I didn't realize that. Okay, quick look at the local oscillator. This is the bit that's down to leaf. This is a 101 megahertz Butler oscillator. Okay, if you know me, you know Butler oscillators. Uh, Leaf came up with a few changes to the original uh, Butler oscillator. The performance, phase noise performance improved dramatically from a standard Butler. Um, it's multiplied times four in there, so the, this 145 dBc per hertz at 404 megahertz, it's 10 kilohertz separation. Um, we're, this is the best that I can measure. I've got a notch filter to use in my um, spectrum analyzer and I still can't get down low enough. But the, the lowest figure I'm fairly happy with is that this is round about neg 157 to neg 158 dBc per hertz at 101. And I'm sure it's probably as much as 10 dB better than that. But I'm limited by my test equipment. A little bit of noise introduction there, so say neg 144 dBc per hertz, low pass filter, so we've got plus 12, plus 13 at 404. So that's the, the local oscillator lineup. Now a question I'm always being asked is about local oscillator locking. 
the crystal that I supply as standard is a 20 parts per million Cristalli crystal. And they're fairly low cost, hence in kit cost of the kit down. Um, how do you stabilize the whole thing? There's lots of different ways of doing it, but the simplest, by far, is just to take your external local oscillator, say a ZL PLL, or more popular these days is going to be a Leo Bodnar, set it to 101, <coughs> zero dBm external input, <coughs> don't take the crystal out in the IC -ney. Leave it in there. That's the question it's usually asked. Leave the crystal in there. It will injection lock itself to the input signal. The close-in phase noise will be largely determined by this source, but not completely. And the far out, where these are usually pretty terrible, will be determined by the input oscillator. You end up with a, you know, you get something for nothing almost. So that's the arrangement. If you want something, you can have this GPS stabilised, plug that in when you want it, but if, you, if it's inconvenient to have an external oscillator, just run it on the internal one. And it'll lock up over about plus or minus a kilohertz, maybe one and a half kilohertz. You can soon see on the output when, when it unlocks. So that's what I've been doing, but then this other question came up. I want to run diversity on two or 70. I want two ICs, one at all. Anglias, one as a transverter and one as a received converter only. How do I lock the oscillators in phase? Um, so I took the opportunity that I got this one, and, and you won't believe this, but I've actually got several of these. So, I did this. Let me go on one slide first, just so you see what it looked like. These are the two transverters with the splitters. And what we've got here are the two signal generators. They're both relatively low noise ones. Uh, this one is on 101 megahertz. This is my lower noise one. The ZFRSC42 feeding 101 in there and 101 in there. This one, the Marconi, set to a signal frequency, 432.2. Split again, RF input into that one. RF input into that one. So I've now got two 28 meg IF outputs. I put those into channel one and channel two of my spectrum analyzer, uh, of my oscill uh, oscilloscope. What I find is these two are locked together. They're in phase. There's a phase difference between them, but that's purely down to path length or, or whatever. I can put a little piece of cable in there and bring them, bring them back exactly in phase. They appear to be phase lock. Now, I, I cannot prove that any other way. I don't know how, with my test equipment, I can prove this phase locking. But to my mind, those two are locked in phase, so they should be suitable for use with a diversity system. I won't say I'll welcome questions on that afterwards, because I don't know how to answer them. But So there we are, back to, back to what I was saying. We've got the two transverters, they're the uh, SCF42s, uh, one of the two signal generators, the analyzer not in use here, the scope's over here somewhere, but that was the, uh, I make no apologies for the state of my bench, <laughs> if, you've got a, if you have got a clear bench, then there's something wrong with you. <laughs> Here's a uh, close-up of the two traces on the scope. Um, all I've done here is I've adjusted the level of one of them slightly to bring, bring them to, to the same amplitude. There's a very slight difference of gain in the two transverters and therefore that accounts for the amplitude differences, but I've just equalized them by changing the gain. So, coming to an end, um, there's the IC. Yeah, that's, that's not this one, it's, it's a different one. You can, by all means, come and have a look at this at uh, coffee time. Uh, a couple of things here. Um, it was designed as a, a low-cost, good, but not phenomenal transverter, although it's evolving and it's become pretty good now. Uh, readily upgrade, up, upgradable for power output using Mitsubishi modules, or John, G4BAO, is doing a nice little driver kit, which this will 
drive very happily, and John's got some of the kits out there. He, he asked me to, to mention that specifically. <laughs> now, they are good. I've been using one. Um, can be frequency locked with simple frequency injection locking, although you can build a phase lock loop around it if you really insist. Two appear to be usable for uh, dual polarity diversity reception. If you need a preamplifier, then the PGA 432 has got an output intercept which is way higher than this transverter. Uh, presently, I've got a number of kits. So, uh, having handled well over 100,000 uh, surface mount components, I'm reaching the stage now where I'm getting really cheesed off with marking little tiny 0805s and putting them in bags. I may well revert to saying, here's a board, here's a box, here's a mixer. You buy your own bits. <laughs> if you really want to build one. Uh, and this is fully documented on my web page. You can quite freely go on and have a look at the evolution of it. It's all in there, how to put it together, all the rest of it. I think that's it, because I don't think the version I sent to Jan had thank you on the end of it, so I apologise. Thank you very much indeed for listening to me. Thank you very much, uh, Sam. And well, maybe some some you can't answer, but I will give them the uh, opportunity Absolutely. to ask some questions. Are there some questions? Yes. Yes. Uh, Sam, thanks uh, very much for the beautiful presentation. I have a question about uh, the Rogan Schwarz SM SMG. Is it uh, good enough for the two tone tests and uh, the other tests? I think your transfer will be very much better. The figures are much better if you use another source, I maybe. Th I think you're absolutely right. And yeah, sorry. I think you're absolutely right. Uh, for the two meter Anglian tests, I built a DC8 RI. <laughs> uh, I built three of them. These are acknowledged as probably the best crystal oscillators that you or I could put together. Uh, they're not cheap to assemble because of the parts you use inside them. GM3 SEK had a, a batch of boards made. Um, I made up several of those. Those are way down in the neg 160 odds, 170 dBc per hertz at 10 kilohertz offset. My tests uh, on the Anglian, we were done using that and a 10 pole notch filter, crystal notch filter to get the dynamic range. And I still didn't get low enough, but at that stage I thought, it, good enough. <laughs> yeah, okay. Thank but you. Yes, you're right. I, the SMG is not perfect. It's what I've got, and I didn't have to pay for it. It came at the right price. You did a great job. Thank you. More questions? Yes. Hi, Hi yeah. Sam. Thanks. Uh, the phase noise figure that you gave, 100 minus 145, what offset was that? 10 kilohertz. 10 kilohertz. Thanks very much. More. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And of course.